Carter, thanks for jumping in and volunteering to sit in on my Systems Thinking podcast. Happy to um, be here. Yeah, yeah, good to, good to see you. Happy Friday. We're recording on a Friday, uh, Friday, uh, almost noon for me here on the East Coast. Um, so, you know, the way that I open these things, the way that I always start is um, there's kind of two principles that I, that I kind of go by. And one is there's no substitute for passion. And two is the more you know about something, the more interesting it is. So um, with that, I'll, I'll open the question is, uh, what are you most passionate about and what do you know the most about? And also feel free to introduce yourself if you, if you prefer. Sure, sure. So just to give a quick introduction then, my name is Carter Kreck. I am a director of strategic innovations and solutions at United Language Group. And I have been in the localization industry for about a decade now. So I started my career off in the project management side of the world, starting from coordination through program management. And then recently within the last year, switched into this position, which predominantly deals with our team's uh, bid coordination and proposal management, but also the solutions architect side of the business as well, solving business challenges through technical applications. Excellent. Um, yeah, so just jotting some notes down. So, you know, fantastic experience. But so taking a step back, what are you most passionate about and what do you know most about? And it doesn't have to be career related, but it can be. Oh, boy. So there's there's a number of different ways. So obviously, AI is a huge, a huge one right now. And I actually uh, have an interest in the application of AI towards kind of more of a contextual edutainment is something that I've been kind of working my thoughts through. And what I kind of mean by that is like the the application of of skills and the, the sorry, the acquisition of skills through unconventional medium. So a good, a good example would be like uh, right now, what would be considered a little bit more um, acceptable or easy to follow would be the, the transferable skills that are gained through, let's say like uh, military war games, right. Where, you know, you could easily argue that communication, leadership tactics, things of that sort transfer over to the civilian and professional worlds as well from, uh, from the military, taking that a next step further, then you could also make the same type of argument for, let's say football, right? American football. So those same, same three ones right there, tactics, leadership, communication are easy ones that you could see being built upon and honed through the play of the, uh, through the, through the craft of the game. So if you take it one step further, now this is a little bit more tailored to me because I also have a passion for, uh, for video games, for anime and overall in general, you could call me a pretty, a pretty big nerd. Um, so a good example of that might be, taking um, one step further and applying those same types of reasoning of transferable skills to the medium of video games. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the, the meme where they're putting the, your, um, your D and D party on a resume. And it's like, you know, met twice, twice weekly for uh, problem solving, you know, problem solving <laughs> exercises with a group of peers. And while there is some tongue, tongue in cheek there, I think at the core of it though, it is still something that does have uh that, that does transfer, right? In terms of practicing those, those types of skills. So when you take that then now into the age that we're entering with the fourth industrial revolution here, the application of that, even just in traditional uh, game mediums that exist today is still, you know, mouse, keyboard, screen, virtual reality as it exists now and augmented reality powered by the back end of with Gen AI and being able to essentially simulate, you know, anything almost in real time, right? Within you know, within uh, as soon as the that kind of those deployments get uh, get pushed out there, but I could easily see uh, an example where, like, you know, let's take um, somebody who's interested in learning more about you know leadership, right? Typically nowadays, you might go through like a, a boot camp or re read some webinars or do some maybe a little bit of one to one role playing with a mentor, perhaps. But most of it is going to be very uh, very clinical, you know, very sterile in nature in terms of like how we typically engage with an education as a whole. Now, that part, you know, that that is something, of course, that I I pursue myself. But it's definitely, you know, not uh, not something that gets you fired up, you know, when you're like, oh boy, let me, I'm I'm all ready to go for this eight hour lecture. It's super super good to go there, right? But if you take advantage of the the ability to have something not feel like work or effort, but more play with the, with the, the benefit of, of learning and, and, um, you know, additional takeaways from it, then that makes things significantly easier. So 
if if we were to let's say craft something to myself uh, again even just using existing technology now you could uh, craft a game where let's say uh, the name of the game is uh, like village commander let's just say right it's set in a medieval a medieval setting uh, kind of playing to the like the D and D tabletop RPG type of type of crowd right and we'll just say also that it sets you it's using uh, current virtual reality technology. So that that stuff aside, right? The if the back end of it is powered by procedural generation and Gen AI, the game itself could leverage the tech to put you in scenarios in which you need to to uh, to demonstrate leadership, right? So so that you can learn firsthand and in a context that resonates more with you, right? That's more exciting and is something that might even be more memorable, right? Like you know, I'm not going to be 10 years from now telling somebody about the eight hour course that I sat through, but I might tell somebody about the village I saved from Im imminent destruction during this really epic, you know, battle that ensued. And thanks to my, my leadership skills of planning a strategy ahead of time, getting the buy-in of all the villagers, relying on my, you know, my council's support to make sure that it was sound and uh, had merit to it. You know, I was able to see the day through, right. You know, that those kinds of scenarios could be all supported in real time by Gen AI that's, uh, prompted or programmed to do so, and could even be supported by, like I mentioned, they're kind of like an advisor type character, where in the context of it, you know, the game will th throw scenarios at you, where you are expected to practice different types of leadership, perhaps, and it's trying to teach a particular lesson or give you multiple options, kind of like a, you know, choose your own adventure book, so to speak. Um, but then the advisor role can also help to break down uh, anything that's not implicitly picked up upon by the uh, by the student or the or the player in that case, right? So the 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 advisor could break down how they thought that you know the meeting with the the angry townsfolk went and how you handled it, um, <laughs> and maybe some some additional options to consider next time, right? Um, but all that could happen in real time since the the AI is capable of understanding the the speech that the player is asking of it for further enlightenment as to okay, well why why do you think this didn't work, right? Why were the townspeople angry when I told them that no, they couldn't have any more time off? They we need we need food. At the village <laughs> i so love it that's yeah so that's something that i'm super excited for is that to see where where ai goes with that and to be able to unlock new ways of of gaining gaining insight and education about you know anything that that people are are interested in but in a context that resonates more with them yep no i mean it it it's like the the holodeck right that's kind of the the dream of of having a simulation environment that is adaptive and intelligent and also calibrated to where you're at and what you mm -hmm. need um so you know the the combination of vr I, I guess you don't even necessarily need vr you know just a camera and a microphone for some of these challenges yeah um but vr could make it more immersive um but really it sounds like generative ai is a functional step change that allows some of these some of these things to give you experiences and challenges that you otherwise would, I guess you could get them, but they might be a little bit more expensive or higher friction to set up, right? Like not everyone is going to have the option of being a coach or a battlefield commander or whatever um, in a realistic or challenging environment. Like obviously games are very challenging, but there's, there's cert certain limitations. And, and that I think like even before Gen AI, I think games are probably one of the closest things that come to, you know, simulating a stressful environment, right? Like it may, it may not be stressful in the same context of how, you know, being in an active combat zone is, you know, and the, and the weight of those kind of snap decisions don't have the same gravitas to them, but, you know, in the context of a, you know, five player, let's, let's say it like a, a MOBA, like league of legends is an example, right? You know, in the heat of the, in the heat of the moment, especially if it's any sort of like professional play, you know, your decisions matter in the, the weight, uh, of of what your um like the, the shots that you call with your team matter right and the outcomes could be you know costing your team millions of dollars if it's professional otherwise it could just be it costs you the game in terms of casual play and it's again not the end of the world there but uh the same kind of adrenaline rush and the stress that you get of being in that scenario is something that i think is is the current at least one of the ways that i could see currently of simulating those environments but if you take it a step further then you know, when people are looking for for leadership that has that is tried and true, so to speak, right? Barring actual experience of things like, you know, corporate, um, what am I trying to say? Like, uh, like, like uh, corporation corporational issues where like the it's a struggling company and they brought it, you know, brought it back around from the brink of bankruptcy there, or somebody who actually was deployed and and is a veteran from an active uh, campaign, 
um, barring those situations, it's really difficult to to gain to not be green coming out of something, right? You you to not have that experience and be bat, you know, quote unquote, battle ready in whatever the profession uh, may be. But through something similar to what I just described there, you can actually be put in more realistic situations, you know, fantasy or otherwise, uh, that actually help to put you in situations to see how you really would react in real time and in these kinds of situations to give you more uh, hours, you know, under the um, in the cockpit, so to speak, so that you're you know coming out of the gate with a little with a step up, right, from uh, actually having experienced gone through these you know, gone, gone through making a plan and dealing with the ramifications of the outcome and being able to learn from it all, right? As opposed to having to do that for the first time with real world stakes and real world money and companies and right. whatnot. So, well, and, and that goes to like why experience is the best teacher. But if you can simulate a stressful environment that is realistic enough, then that counts or is close enough to the real, the real thing. And so just quickly characterizing, cause you know, it's, there's a tremendous amount of utility in this, but also it can be entertaining, right? I like the mm -hmm. term edutainment, contextual edutainment. Um, I hadn't heard that, that before, but it sounds like, so some of the criteria that go into a successful, stressful environment, a learning environment is uncertainty of outcome, uh, sense of urgency. There, there's a time component, um, which means that you need uh, you also need good discernment or good judgment as to what to do, um, which that requires skills, knowledge, so on and so forth. But then it's Frameworks. also high stakes. There's risk of failure and there's consequences. So th would you agree that those are kind of the primary ingredients? Did I miss anything um, that kind of goes into these sim a good stressful environment for contextual uh, experiences? I would say so. Um, the only other ones that I would be toying with there is some sort of some sort of oppositional actor perhaps could, but that could also fall into uncertainty there. Um, same thing with also there's um, there's a word for it in game theory, the, the not both sides, not having the same information. Imperfect information. The, the right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like an element of that too, which again, I think plays into uncertainty, but I, mm -hmm. I think you're, you're correct then. Yeah. I think, I think the thing that I missed was oppositional or, or adversarial agents where you've got something that, that also has some agency is working against you, whether yes. it's a hostile actor or the environment itself, or the clock is ticking. It could be a system failure or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a VR game. It was keep talking and nobody dies Yeah, or, yeah. or, 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 or the bomb doesn't explode or whatever. Playing that with my family is hilarious. Cause it's like, I don't know if it, for, for the audience, if you haven't heard of this, or played it it's a pretty rare or obscure game but it's like you have a you have a, a manual like a printout that says like if the bomb has this this and this features then you have to do x y and z things to defuse the bomb and that's the whole point is is someone is in a vr headset trying to defuse a bomb and then you have their their like radio operator and only and so you can't you can't see what the person in vr is seeing and they can't see the manual so it's a it's a trial of communication and, mm -hmm. and observational skills and discernment and judgment. Um, and so in this case, the adversary is the bomb is going to go off. But in other cases, like combat fighter pilots, the adversary could be, you know, a blue team, red team, kind of you're trying to shoot each other down out of the sky. I just watched a, a Top Gun Maverick last year. So that's kind of fresh on my mind um, as an example of, of that's a simulated environment, but it's a very high stress environment. Um, mm. So, yeah, great, great stuff. Um, I, th I think uh, the, the last piece there, too, for the adversarial, sometimes depending on the nature of it, is also yourself, right? Where <laughs> you're trying to, I mean, in the, in the sense that you're trying to be better than you were before or right. you're trying to top your last high score, right? You know, kind of seeing how far you can go and pushing your your limits there. So that, that I think, at the end of the day is the, the, the default, maybe, the default adversary if no other actor uh, is, is present, you know, or in, maybe yep. even, even, even in combination with the others. So I want to I want to go two directions from here, and I know you had some topics that you wanted to touch on too. So one is is leadership because leadership is is you know everyone talks about it, and there's all million different ways to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. But then also game theory. So you mentioned game theory. We've talked about competition, and so one thing that's been really interesting to me is finite games versus infinite games. So like finite games where there is a where there is a, a clear victor, the game ends it has fixed rules versus infinite games where the point is to keep playing the rules can evolve and it's more about value co-creation rather than competition or generative competition. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Which direction do you want to go? Do you want to pivot to leadership or talk about game theory or both if you, if they're related? Sure, sure. Let's, 
let's start with with game theory there. And I do think that game theory, especially the concept of the of the infinite game, is something that is that is very um, integrated closely. I think with systems thinking as a whole is mm. you know understanding that you know the system like being like at the ultimate system right is the infinite game right it needs to life itself needs to keep going and everything is a subsystem within that kind of as a as systems within systems framework um but ultimately like that is the the i think the the tendency of most most systems is that they're they're typically aimed at being perpetual in nature all right or like that that would be the goal or even the systems themselves want to maintain uh existence in some way or momentum right so i think that's kind of that's kind of more of a of a feeling that on my side yeah. i don't you know i don't have anything to <laughs> to back that up per se but that's that's just what i'm i'm feeling no, if if you just kept going with that i was totally on board so <laughs> i agree i agree with it. yeah and i think with with systems thinking what makes it a little bit more or systems in general and what makes it more difficult in the concept of keeping the infinite game going is that the the game itself is is pay to play, so to speak, where there's there's some the cos cosmic tokens that are required to to keep the game going in the form of uh, in, which are constantly being drained by entropy. Right. So most systems, if not all of them, typically minus maybe some exceptions are uh, drift. They tend towards towards entropy and it requires energy to keep them going or to uh, to improve them, right, or to make make changes and, and whatnot. But overall, give, you know, given enough time, they they drift towards towards entropy. So that's kind of what I mean by the the tokens ticking down kind of piece, and you needing to keep uh, keep feeding the machine tokens to keep the infinite game going. There is in, yep. in the form of energy. I love that. I love that concept of cosmic tokens. I'm totally going to be using that um, because from this perspective, and, and also the observation that like it's that's and it's antagonistic to kind of the intrinsic entropy of many systems particularly natural systems where mm -hmm. you know chaos increases over time or entropy or however you want to measure it or you have a drain on energy time that sort of thing um and i had a thought but it ran away um oh yeah so the <laughs> the kind of the, the perspective that i have been working on is the idea of divergence versus convergence so like some of these natural systems Entropy is a form of natural divergence where energy goes different directions, uh, complex systems can diverge, Just, uh, but convergence or that energy to bring things back together is part of, or maybe that's a kind of cosmic token um, to keep the, keep the system going. Because if it diverges too much, you end up with you know heat death of the universe or whatever, but gravity holds it back together or civilization holds it together or the rules of the game hold it together. Something kind of pulls it back together. In, into some sort of nexus or confluence. That's kind of how I'm seeing things right now. Um, some work in I, progress. Yeah, yeah I, I would I would agree. And you know, not to. Um, I, I was reading in preparation here for for this. I was rereading a lot of your articles, and particularly, of course, the one about systems thinking. And I guess to to start, have you had any further revelations as it relates to the the five core pillars since having produced that article, or any amendments um, to it? Yeah, so the for for anyone who hasn't read it, the there's there's five key principles of systems thinking that have kind of emerged as I've talked to people. And so the first is uh, communication um and this is in no particular order. I think they're all equally important, but communication is pillar 1, um understanding people and all the dynamics, uh, intrinsic extrinsic motivations and systems of people is pillar 2. Um and measurements is pillar 3, so uh, basically, the the mantra there is you can't change something if you don't measure it, um, but also you need to make sure that you know what you're measuring and that you get tight feedback loops. Number four is outcomes. Systems thinking is very objective oriented or mission oriented. And then number five is networks or systems themselves, which is collections of nodes that are interconnected or loosely connected um, and layered and intersecting with each other. So quick background for any listeners. Um, but the short answer is is not really um, is I, I have had some people push back. Um, who who prefer to take systems thinking from more of a cognitive uh, approach rather than kind of a broader thing. And I do agree that like understanding feedback loops, um, understanding metacognition, because this is also where I started. I started thinking that systems thinking was primarily about metacognitive skills and thinking strategies. But as I talked to systems thinkers, they were primarily talking about 
measurements, people, and communication were kind of the three big things that came up. And then, of course, you have to understand systems. You have to understand, uh, you have to have subject matter expertise. You have to be a physicist or uh, someone who's in logistics or a mathematician. So you do need some level of expertise. But what was interesting to me is that the systems thinkers that I talked to, subject matter expertise was almost secondary. Um, so that's kind of shoehorned in under people. So, but you need mm -hmm. many different people, many different experts to make a successful system. So it's not that it's unimportant, but it's, it's under that pillar of people. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, one of the things that has emerged through conversation. Um, and I don't know, maybe those five pillars will change over time, but that's to, to answer your question. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of where the, the model is at right now. Okay. Yeah. So if, if I could try to expand on that a little bit and, uh, submit maybe two additional ones for consideration, okay. um, the, the first reason being is that if you flip flop around where some of the letters are and then add in these two, which are D and R, you can make the acronym uh, commander, which is pretty fun. Uh, and then the second one is the, how they relate in, in the system itself. So the, the D that I added there is dynamic resilience. So that is kind of meant to encapsulate the, the need for continuous evolution and continuous improvement within a system, both to, to keep momentum moving forward and to, you know, keep the fight against entropy going, or even if, you know, if the objective or the outcome is to get ahead of it or change, you know, something fundamentally, then a consistent amount of effort needs to be applied. Um, and the same type of effort over and over again may not always be sufficient as the, the rest of the system evolves over time, right? So it's, it's meant to kind of represent that, you know, proactive adaptation, um, innovative momentum, so keeping innovation going, uh, continuous learning and evolution, and then uh, the continuous need for uh, ener energetic investment was kind of the the four parts of the the dynamism there to, to make it more I resilient. Love that. Yeah. yeah. So the last one then for the um for the R then the unfortunately I had I have a better name for it that I like more which is uh, chaotic harmony but unfortunately that didn't end in R to make the fun acronym so I changed it to regulated chaos. So and that one is more around the the principle of understanding that systems as a whole exists typically in a state that is neither fully chaotic nor fully ordered, right? They're somewhere in between, and it's a kind of a harmonic balance between chaos and order in order to make the, and how the, the, the system functions. So there's a lot of, um, uh, most systems typically reflect some, somewhere on the spectrum of this, like, uh, like let's say city traffic is a good example where the roadways and the system that makes up the, the, the infrastructure is relatively uh, order orderly, right? It's, it's rigid. It's, you know, there's, there's rules for the road and how to do it, but then the people driving on the roads and how they interact with the system itself is the agent of chaos, right? Somebody could be looking at their phone, you know, eating while they're driving, driving a car that's shouldn't really be on the road at this point in time. Uh, the snow, the weather, right? Like there's all, all sorts of other factors that contribute chaos to that, to that system. And it's the, the balance of the two. Um, so it's, it's kind of a leaving, it's a pillar that leaves room for, for one, just, you know, accepting that and kind of keeping it in mind, but then also the recognition that systems evolve over time with thus displaying emergent behavior as part of it too, right? Which can introduce further chaos or, or add to that need for the, the sixth pillar of being able to adapt to that in the first place, or make sure that the system is resilient enough that when emergent or latent behavior appears that it can withstand it to keep, keep running. And it doesn't just yep. shut the shut the game down there. Yeah. No, another, another term, a similar term. I don't know if you've heard this, but for, for dynamic resilience is, um, anti-fragility. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a, that's, that's a concept that I've learned recently. I haven't read the book yet, but basically the idea is you create systems or structures that are anti-fragile, meaning that there's going to be self-correction mechanisms or self-healing mechanisms within a system, um, that, that you, you, you accept that tension, that chaos, uh, that, that breaks will happen, but you create something that either can cope or compensate or recover, um, mm. from, from any, any intrinsic fragility, because all things are, have some fragility. So I like that, the dynamic resilience and then regulated chaos. Um, I was thinking when you said agent of chaos, I'm like, that sounds like an MCU villain or like the henchmen because chaos is often archetypally like the, the force, the forces of chaos are often likened to the forces of evil. Right. In many stories, they, they are. So I actually I have some interesting follow ups here to go with you uh, go on that. But then one clarification with my, the acronym that I realized I didn't explain is that you change people to agents slash actors. 
which okay. also makes which also works in that same context there and makes the cool acronym possible or feasible. So, so is it communication outcomes, uh, measurement, agents yeah. or actors, whichever one you think sounds better, networks, and then dynamic resilience and regulated chaos being the last one. So yeah. Just jotting that down real quick. And also, don't worry, the editors can ch chop this part out. Good, so good. communication outcomes, metrics, what was it, agents or actors? Yep. And then, and then um, networks. Systems, yep. And then the last one was, um, or the, the last, last two. two are, yeah, dynamic resilience and then regulated chaos. And regulated chaos. I love that. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so I, I had just mentioned like agent of chaos um, and, and like how archetypal villains or, or agents of evil, like chaos and evil are often kind of, uh, synonyms in some stories. So can I, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions here to, to establish, um, some, some sparse priming record, uh, recognition here. <laughs> so do you, are you uh, a game of Thrones fan or have you watched game of Thrones? Uh, I've watched it and read all the books that were out when I was watching and I haven't caught up, I, but yeah, I've read most of it too. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say, which I don't think any new books have come out since, since then either, but, <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> um, okay. So that's, that's good. And then the other one was, um, uh, oh shoot. Now oh, my thought ran away. Uh, that we're talking happens. about agents of chaos. Oh, oh uh, uh, um, Warhammer. Are you familiar with the Warhammer lore at all? Uh, a little bit, but I know that it's also enormous. So, <laughs> well, yeah, and and even barring barring all of that, right? But the, most of the the way you could boil it down for even like the just the fantasy lore compared to the 40k stuff is uh, it's it's order and chaos are the two sides, right? You've got all the mm. humanoid factions like the elves and the humans and all that kind of stuff in the fantasy lore, and then against the the forces of chaos, so the chaos gods, you know, the basically the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, that kind of um, that kind of vibe. So. Uh, in in that framework, so the reason that I think this is this is interesting is, uh, and these questions are relevant is first off is uh, are you familiar with um, synaptics, or syne mm -mm. yeah synaptics? Um, so this this is a, another creative thinking tool that plays into uh, systems thinking where it's it's the, if you were to boil it down, it's basically using um, analogy as a means of uh, changing making the unfamiliar familiar and the familiar unfamiliar. So it's kind of a, like a creative thinking technique to get your mind out of the box. And, um, the guy who, who started it also did, uh, started springboarding as well as another method of, of brainstorming, but yeah. synaptics in, in general is something that I, I resonate with greatly, um, because it helps to, it, it, it expedites the process and it also leads to some really cool thought exercises for systems thinking where if you change it like, okay, well, if this is this in this universe, then what is this or what is, you know, how does this interact with it? And it gives you kind of a, a fun framework to be able to play with that. And it also shortens the time needed to get people on the same level. So that's kind of where the sparse priming piece comes in there is that I can mm -hmm. just say, hey, you know, Star Trek? Yeah, I love Star Trek. Great. You know, remember when this happens in this episode? Yeah. Well, that's just like systems thinking. And you're like, oh right. my gosh, I totally, you know, and that goes back yeah. to the contextual learning part that I mentioned too, is when you speak in somebody else's language, they're, they're quicker on the uptake, right? Because they understand it in a different mental model or different, different framework that relates to them more that they're able to use as a basis to then bridge over to what you were maybe talking about in the first place, right? Yep. No, I, I like that. So I, cause I, so one of the writing podcasts that I listened to is writing excuses and they talked about that. I don't know if they use the same word, but they talked about, they use that turn of phrase, make the familiar unfamiliar and make the unfamiliar familiar. Um, and, and yeah, so using, using analogy, using metaphor, um, I'm glad I have a word for that. Cause I had always thought of it as making distal connections through abstractions and generalization. Um, and just to, to clarify too, it's, it's synectics. I, I misspoke. Synectics. It's not a P. Yep. S Y N E C T I C S synectics. It's like a, sounds like a portmanteau of like synaptic and connections. So yeah. 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 <laughs> um, cool. But yeah, so, so I, I like those examples. Do you have any other, any more examples of, of how to do this? Cause I think, I think that by virtue of that's kind of the definition of synectics, which is making those connections. What are some other examples of how to make the familiar unfamiliar and vice versa? Let me, do you mind if I put a pin a pin in that and finish the, what I was connecting yeah. that to? So sure. you, you mentioned agents of chaos. So the other relevant tie in there was, um, with game of Thrones. So I would, uh, I also came to the, the conclusion yesterday doing some, some noodling on this, that, uh, so the character of, uh, Peter Baelish, right. Uh, little finger, he's the conniving scheming kind of guy, but in general, I would, I thought to myself, I was like, okay, 
so he he is a he is a systems thinker. Mm-hmm. Was my was my argument there. He understands the big picture and the intercom you know the complexity of how inter- everything is interconnected and how the systems interact with each other, the systems of the you know the politics of the land, how people tend to act in and of themselves, the desires of of humans based on their own situations that they're in that may impact you know how they would behave in a certain situation. Um, you know, he aligns with, he does a lot of, uh, strategic long-term planning where he's sowing seeds and everywhere to see kind of where, where they pan out, um, and being able to adapt, uh, adapt to them as, as they play out. Um, and then also going through all sorts of different types of scenario planning, right? Where his, his line is, uh, what is it? Fight, fight all the battles everywhere in your mind. Everyone is your friend. Everyone is your enemy. So it's mm. kind of that, like that, that, that forced, uh, situational exercise where you're like, okay, well, what, what do we do if this happens? Well, what do we do if this happens? Well, what do we do if the tables are turned here? Um, so I just thought that was interesting. It's it's, and then his other line too, of chaos is a ladder, right? Right. That if you take that in the context of, you know, general, more, more general systems thinking and the entropy um, and the energy that, that, as you mentioned there, that systems kind of give off, right. Or that entropy gives off naturally being able to, to harness that energy through an opportunistic moment in the, in the fashion of, of Peter Baelish, as an example, um, can actually generate theoretically more order than the chaos than there was before through uh, using leverage points in the system. Right. Right. So, and, and it's, it's a, uh, just a thought that I've been kind of playing around with there where it's like, you know, using, using the, the energy that's in a, in a system of chaos or using chaos as energy to out- affect affect outcome, excuse me, affect order, uh, in a way that was greater than it was before. Is that, is that track with you? Is that? Lo- yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, cause I'm, I'm putting together some thoughts cause I just finished reading Ray Dalio who talks about how, uh, societies naturally go through cycles of order and disorder or di- order, disorder, reorder. Um, so that's like, that's like the opportunity and chaos. Um, and, but also once the system, you know, like you, you can have attractor states in systems that are, you know, pulling you towards more chaos until something changes and then it pulls towards, towards order. Um, but then also once it breaks or once something shifts, once you have enough entropy that allows for the system to restructure itself. And then the and you're saying like, you're right. You, you have, you can have catalysts. Um, you don't always need catalysts. You can have smaller internal uh, dislocations and restructures kind of thinking in terms of like crystal structure. Um, Mm -hmm. but then, but, but also I think that, I think that part of this, part of the cycle is, um, levels of energy, like the level, the energy goes up and the energy goes down because, you know, you think about natural systems, they tend to kind of settle into the lowest energy state. That's why like the surface of water is flat. It, it seeks the lowest possible level. Mm -hmm. Likewise, I think that, I think that all energetic systems, um, at, at least at some point, seek the lowest energetic system uh, level, kind of a, an equilibrium or status quo, but that's not permanent, right? Like you said, there's also an intrinsic force that trends towards chaos or disorder or whatever. Uh, but you're talking about just a quick other, another analogy from fiction is, um, so there's a, like in Star Wars, you know, light side versus dark side. In Destiny, the video game, there's the the forces of light versus the forces of dark. So order, chaos, it's, you know, all these bipolar um, energies, whether you call it entropy versus order, uh, or, you know, more, more mythic archetypal versions. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but it's, you know, or chaos, whatever, there's all kinds of ways of expressing this, this dichotomy in particular. I also, one thing that I want to, uh, just reiterate really quickly was that even snow could be an agent of chaos. If the system is the road, I like that. (laughs) Like it, cause snow itself is not evil, right? It's just an energetic change of the surface quality, right. And, and uh, visibility. Um, but you can also have actors, you know, uh, uh, agents who are deliberately working towards it. Like, like, uh, Lord, Lord Baelish, um, mm-hmm. who's a great example, by the way. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't necessarily have to be intrinsically evil. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's kind of a recap. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so speaking of not intrinsically evil too. So like, uh, one of the other parallels that I drew was, um, let's say open AI's release of chat GPT back in November. Right. I'd say in, in general, that was relatively shocking, right. Especially as far as like its capabilities, how quickly it took off, like the, you know, millions of users that signed up within days. Um, in general, I would say that kind of, to me seems like a, um, like a chaotic action or introducing chaos into a system, 
um, but for for an end goal of greater order, right? So in this case, it was kind of a, a you know regulated chaos, so to speak, where they intentionally introduced it at the state that it's at now to be able to learn from how the system reacts to this change to then make a, you know a, a leverage a um, to le to use a leverage point later on that will have greater effect, having known you know some more about the system itself and and lessening the gap of unknown unknowns or uh, lessening the the weight of the um, skewed information. Right. I love viewing chat GPT as an agent of chaos. That just makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, okay, yep, no, that, that, that checks out. But yeah, so like it, it was a disruptive forcing function, right? And AI broadly is a disruptive forcing function or a catalyst more simply put. And, and to your last point, um, the economy, society, whatever, all these big global or, or national or international systems are what's called a complex adaptive system, which means that it's not, it's not, it doesn't have fixed rules. It adapts based on your perception of the system itself or your interaction with the system. And so it kind of, kind of the, the point, the, the way that for instance, chat GPT can, the release of chat GPT could trend towards more stability or more order is that you have to interact with the system to see how it reacts because it was totally unpredictable what chat gpt was the the long-term fallout and then that creates more information more feedback which then speaks to the next iteration of the system which goes back to your point earlier about um was it dynamic resilience and you need mm -hmm. more information about the system and, and systems you know nested systems all the way down and up in order to understand those those interactions and reactions but even if you can't fully model them you can at least correlate okay we did this and it had x you know x x x action had y result and then you can build a theory around it, but then you collect more data points over time. And that's kind of like bringing simplicity to the complexity, which is, it's about that feedback. It's about that feedback loop and tightening that loop and, and trying to discern valuable knowledge from that. Exactly. And, and it's introducing uh, movement and action into a system, like you said, that, that tends towards the lowest energy state, right? So if you're looking, if you're looking at a pond with its sheer surface there and you're unsure of whether or not it's water or is it ice, right? Well, an easy way to tell is to chuck a rock in, right? There you go. It, it disturbs, it adds chaos to the system, causes a ripple effect, and you can observe it and see, ah, yes, that is ripples, or oh no, it bounced, um, yep. or it has unintended consequences <clears> and it breaks <throat> through the ice and now the whole thing is back to water again, you can't walk across it, or whatever the unintended outcome was there. But um, by interacting with the system or forcing chaos into a system, you can then you know, ascertain more information to improve the system in the, in the long run or make a more uh, informed decision as to yep. how to uh, interact within the system. Yep. And, well, and this, this sound, this reminds me of just like fundamental laws of physics, like thermodynamics, like heat at rest. If there's no gradient, then no work gets done, right? Just basic law of, of, of physics. And so you need energy gradients or information gradients. You need some kind of gradient for things to happen. And so mm -hmm. when you, when you chuck a rock into a pond, you, that you then have a mechanical energy gradient. So there's more energy in the center of the pond and it, radiates outwards. Um, and I've, I've thought about gradients in terms of economics as well. So for instance, right now, the system is trending towards more wealth concentration. And so you have this very steep gradient between the top 1% and everyone else. Whereas 50, you know, in the 50s, that gradient was much shallower. And so the system was intrinsically more stable when there was less economic gradient, when there was less uh, power gradients. But now the gradients are very steep which means that the system is intrinsically unstable or ready for change. I don't know if unstable is the right word. Um, but when you have higher gradients, you have higher ability for change. Would you kind of agree with that characterization? Yeah. So yeah, push back. higher, yeah, higher gradients or higher gaps between the extremes um, in, increases volatility, right. Or, or the, the likelihood of a, of a um, chaotic outcome, so to speak. Right. Um, it's kind of like the, I, the other thing I kind of liken it to is the, the use of in, in, uh, uh, again, in some sort of, in some different tabletop games, like, uh, chaos magic, right. Where there, there is a chance that it could go horribly wrong, but you are aiming towards a goal that you're trying to achieve in some way, but it, you know, you could turn into a potted plant for, for all, you know, right. But, you know, ultimately the goal of converting your mana or energy into magic, you know, to, is achieve some end that you're looking to, to do, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully for the, the better of the world or, or the, at least the adventuring party, but right. I love it. I love it. So, um, 
Yeah, no, that that's that's all great stuff. Did you want to add anything to to the to the systems thinking game theory uh, line of line of thinking? Because this is this is great stuff. Um, let me see. So the other the other thought that I had kind of around it um, builds off of your one of your more recent interviews with the um, I forgot her name unfortunately, but the educational uh, the lady. Lara? Um, Lara, yes. Lara. Yep, yep. And the, the, the talk around, <clears throat> like, instead of, you know, pathologizing or working against uh, people's own innate uh, selves, right? Like people with ADHD or, or other, you know, cognitive, um, different cognitive uh, methods and trying to go, go more along with it, right? So, like, to harness it or to steer it and, and leverage it to your own advantage, I, I kind of had a parallel thought of using that, using the chaos within systems in a similar way. Where instead of necessarily trying to fight something, just kind of going along with it or steering it or using that as the energy, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, to do something different with it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like le- leveraging creative, creative potential, so to speak. Well, and that that goes along with um, another article that I wrote recently, which was likening um, Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy, particularly around uh, Taoism and Wu Wei, which is. Um, aligning with with the natural forces of nature and so it's not it's not you know do nothing as in like be completely inert but don't don't resist the natural forces of things Um, whether that's people's nature the nature of the economy the nature of the natural world and rather align with it and you know align with natural economic pressures the scientific directions uh the cardinality of of social narratives and now that's not to say that you can't also influence it, but then you look at the impact, you know, the, the metaphorical equivalent of tossing a rock in a pond, the right idea at the right time can change the nature of the system, right? That like, I'm thinking of the French revolution where the idea of equality and freedom, um, mm-hmm. you know, a, as a way it ultimately caused the restructuring of society. But that idea combined with the 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 gradients the total you know the energy gradients the wealth gradients and power gradients in french society combined with that catalyst resulted in great change very destructive change um, but ultimately something that that uh trended towards as you said more order in the long run um so i like that i like that view. yeah and the other thing that i thought too was the so instead of like like you said working with with the chaos there or or um kind of building around it so to speak in the case of just systems that are naturally disorderly um would be like uh, another a good example of that would be the the fact that you know things are let's just say life itself or or even projects right uh they're they're chaotic in nature things change you know de- uh there's there's people who call in sick if you're you know have a project going on um there's there's delays that come up or other um, emergencies and whatnot. So a way of kind of harnessing that natural state of, uh, chaos there is the agile methodology, right? So taking that into account and building a framework around it that, okay, we know that things are going to change and that priorities will change. And, you know, so we're going to, we're going to adopt the time sale time scale from a traditional project, you know, waterfall flow to something that can react to it more and leverage chaos as a feature, right? Like, like it's supposed to be redone every two weeks and maybe go in a different direction. So the same thing could be used to to explain um, uh, like DAOs, right? I know mm-hmm. you've talked a lot about decentralizing for different things, and that which is kind of chaotic, you know, in comparison to a top-down command and control structure, right? So you intentionally introduce chaos in the form of decentralized authority to achieve a greater goal, and you're working with the nature of you know using the the, the sense of chaos as people's autonomy, right? right. Like that you don't have direct control of them um, to achieve mm-hmm. a greater goal, right? By unlocking right. unlocking that. But then you need, but then you need new structures and systems, and and even new theories, new paradigms to understand. Okay, if if you're trying to make better use of autonomy or chaos or whatever, then what are the functions, the most meaningful functions to to either um, create a necessary level of order, you know, regulated chaos, as you put it, um, in order to coordinate just enough to get the outcomes that you're looking for, rather than continuing to trend towards absolute entropy. Um, but the, but what you just said outlines what I intuitively and couldn't articulate was my my um, personal uh, like uh, philosophy towards um, leadership, which is you 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 don't fight entropy, you don't fight things, but you put the night the 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 people together 
you know, with their agency, with their autonomy, with their intrinsic motivations, with the right structures, and then things should happen. But I haven't been able to figure out the formula yet because <laughs> you need you need something like you said, agile as a methodology allows for a higher degree of autonomy than you know waterfall, for instance. Um, but yeah, so maybe one day I'll figure out how to get a thousand people to code on a project consistently um, without much without much central command or direction. But I haven't figured it out yet. Um, but yeah, so that's, that would, I, I, I like that as a, as a hypothetical possibility. I think, I think that does tie in too, because I know, I know you've spoken to that in one of your recent articles as well. And I think the applying some of the, the different pillars of systems thinking to it too, like obviously I think as part of the structure or the, or the, uh, the framework or guardrails to trying to, you know, rein in the chaos, mm -hmm. um, and keep it all steered towards, you know, towards the one direction. But I think. You know, if I had to choose like a, a powerful force, right, like especially in, in a situation where it is deregulate or like decentralized, it would be that that massive transformative purpose, right? Something that inspires intrinsic motivation and maybe even extrinsic, you know, simultaneously there to be like a powerful guiding force uh, to help keep the momentum going forward within the guardrails. So kind of like the... Um, uh, what is it like the uh, the little uh, the things that make Hot Wheel cars go faster on their tracks? Like one of oh, those yeah. that they can go, yeah. <laughs> little so every, little spinning the spinning wheel to add energy to the system, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like every every inspirational speech that realigns you know the team to the vision acts as one of those in the tracks, which is you know the path the track to success, so to speak, or the track to the goal that you're that you're targeting. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that. You know, it, it makes sense with what you had described to in, in the article as far as like equipping and empowering the team, both in mm -hmm. sense of autonomy and authority, but also through the right tools and skills and, and or yeah, tools and knowledge that they need to be successful. Right. And that's something that I had recently had or th that I had a mentor of mine mention to me that resonated was the, you know, as a leader, you're not expected to to climb to the top of Mount Everest. You are expected to build a team that is capable of reaching the summit. Right. 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 So it kind of kind of the the, the difference in, a, in approach there versus dragging, dragging the team up the hill kind of thing doesn't <laughs> won't get yeah, there in good time. My I had a uh, my my favorite teacher in high school, uh, Mrs. Daly. I don't know if she's still with us. She was she was a little bit older, but uh, I, I had coffee with her once after high school. And um, and we were talking about that. And because and, as a teacher, one of the most frustrating things is you can give a student all the resources, but you can't make them do anything. And so the, the, the lesson that she gave me was you can lead a horse to water and then you can drown the fucking horse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so, uh, but so the formula that I just came up with was purpose. So an MTP, a massive transformative purpose, but purpose, something on the horizon in the future that you want or to change or to create or build plus the guardrails, which are the, the boundaries and constraints plus energy. And that's the, that's how you get the results. And of course you need alignment and a whole bunch of other things, but I, I like that as a, as a relatively simple formula. Now, so you mentioned, you know, leadership. So what a leader does is some of these things. So let's talk about leadership more like in, in your own capacity, like what theories, what lessons have you learned? Um, how does systems thinking apply? How does all this other stuff apply to leadership? So let's just unpack that. Um, then I'll let you, let you start. Sure. Yeah. So for for leadership, um, in in my role, I've been I, I have a certain level of autonomy that I am appreciative of, and one of the things that that has enabled me to do is to uh, kind of develop that my own style or ar architect it so to speak, mm -hmm. and you know provided me the leeway to be able to figure out you know how to tackle the Everest challenge in, in my own in my own manner right, and there's a um, in in that same fashion, there, there's a quote that I really resonate with, which is the um, "Make no little plans, for they have no magic to stir men's blood." Hmm. Uh, there, there's there's more to that um, more to that after afterwards, but that's kind of the the, the key point there. But uh, you know, it's making the plan of how how we're going to get to the top of Mount Everest, and then what are we going to do afterwards when we get there? How you know what is the plan to go even higher? Um, and it's kind of stringing that vision together to to kind of set the tone of where where we're going and where we need to be in the distance so that people, so that the team can align themselves towards it. And the, th this also speaks to the same kind of uh, principles of continuous education and, and continuous self-improvement where, you know, not all training in, 
you know, professional settings or in life will be spoon fed or handed to you, right? You'll need to go out and, and seek this training on your own. And especially if you're looking to improve any sort of like time scale of when you get closer towards understanding or mastery or, or whatever you're, you're searching for. So being able to at least provide the, the point in the distance of where, where the team is going or where the leader is bringing, trying to lead the team to gives context and constraints as to what I should be learning right now, or what should I do that will further the, uh, the mission, right. Or that will make me more useful to the mission or the team, uh, to, to getting us there. Yeah. So I call that, I, I actually just wrote uh, another article, um, uh, that I call, or, or part, part of the article rather is becoming a virtuous agent. Mm. And so when you, when you have that, that archetypal paragon in your mind of, you know, we're going to get to Everest or we're going to get to Mars or we're going to do X or whatever. When you have that goal, when you have that big plan, that big purpose, there is an idea in my mind, there is an idealized, you know, an archetype or a paragon of the kind of leader that is optimal for that solution. And then, so what you're kind of my interpretation of what you're talking about is when, when you, you look at yourself very humbly and you look at the distance between who you are and that optimal archetype, that, that, uh, that archetypal paragon for that purpose. And then what you, what you're, what you just said is that is how you decide what to learn next or the experience that you need next to get closer to being that right, that right agent, that right leader. Is that kind of, how, how does that land for you? I think, I think that tracks. Yeah. It's, it's based on understanding and being able to, you know, not be using the, the vision as a method of avoiding paralysis of choice, right? Like you can use that as the, the lens or the filter from which, you know, what, what should I learn next um, is passed through to be able to figure out what is, what is valuable to the mission? What makes me a better, you know, insert my role here or, you know, what would help us get there that where the team is currently lacking, right? Like, is this something that I can take up and learn that not only synergizes with my, my current position or, you know, but would, would uh, go further, right. Would build, would help the team improve overall. Yeah. So how, so assuming that you've got a vision or a mission and you've got, you've got the, the, the willpower, the hunger, the, the intrinsic motivation, the fire to pursue that. One thing that I have found is it's not often obvious what the next step is. And so for, for me, the best, the best advice that I would have is experiment. You know, if there's something resonating, follow that thread, but some, but more often than not, so there's, there's the known, you know, there's what, you know, then there's the known unknowns, which is stuff that you know exists, but that you don't know. And then there's the unknown unknowns. Um, so like, how do you explore into that space um, in a more systematic or, or structured or, 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 or other way? Um, I guess, I guess I do have one answer to that, which is mentorship, which is you find someone and ask them, Hey, what's my next step. But even then sometimes they don't have the right answer. So what, what are your, like, it, it, even if you're asking that question, what should I learn next? How do you, how do you figure that out in, in, in cases of higher uncertainty and, the unknown unknowns. Experimentation is definitely one of the roots. There's one of the, one of the things that I really like is the kind of spending more time in the divergent thinking space when trying to, when trying to problem solve. Um, I'm not quite sure of how to draw the parallel to what we're talking about right now, but it would be the equivalent of um, like uh, blue sky thinking as an example and a mixture between that and uh, there's a line by Orson Welles that I really, really enjoy where he's, he's on, he's being interviewed and he's asked like, you know, how did you achieve what you did? You know, or sorry, where did you get the confidence to do what you did with a camera? And Orson Welles responds, ignorance, sheer ignorance. (laughs) And the, at the very end of it there, where, where the point that he gets to is the fact that he, he knew enough to be dangerous and nobody ever told him, you know, what you could or couldn't do with a camera or what was it wasn't physically possible or was possible. Um, so he was able to, you know, through, through ignorance and kind of this blue sky thinking or, or, you know, blue sky ignorance that he was able to exist in this space of possibility, right? Like the, the what ifs, you know, and he was able to, he, the line that he mentions is, you know, I thought that you could do anything with a camera that the human eye could do. And he also, you know, hearkens to the fact that he had a really great photo, uh, a cameraman who was willing to, to do this kind of stuff and who understood the way that he put it, that, you know, there's, there's nothing that exists that couldn't be learned in half a day, right? Like, mm. like the, the, the gist of what you need to know about that thing of any, of any profession, right? 
and then you can kind of go from there. So that that typically is a, a, a problem solving technique that I would use where I'll learn enough about something initially to kind of intentionally stay in that like that, you know, blissful, ignorant space so that I can let let that go, uh, let that go wild and combine that with like synectics, for example, where applying it over a metaphor and then, you know, letting that go like, OK, well, where do what can I do with it in this situation? Or where can I go from here and building upon it? Um, I think that that kind of works for the the how to um, how to figure out what to to learn next is you can you know take the initial step right so like take you know a one on one course right and then start to see what's possible or where you know what is um, where this is going and then from there you can start to extrapolate like okay if I'm understanding these skills or if you know using Python is capable of this you know would it be theoretically possible to do something you know, super crazy with it, or, you know, how do I make it do that? And then, you know, be able to start to then systematically assemble knowledge over time to um, kind of build, so build a bunch of knowledge and start to gather sources of information that can help to uh, broaden the breadth of what you're, uh, of what you're looking into. So let's just say like learning code, right? So you're, you're learning a bunch of different guides, one-on-one guides, you know, different tools that are, that are, that could be helpful in, in this endeavor. Um, and then once you've assembled all of your knowledge, then the next part then would be um, engaging with it, right? So looking mm. through, like actually looking through the different tools, like is this actually useful? Doing experimentation, playing around with it, seeing where they they interact. You know, can they? You know, is Python? You know, w- which uh, which system is better to to learn Python? Is it VS Code? Is it a collaborative online notebook? Like, what are the pros and cons of each? And then from there, the last part then would be the consolidation of that into your own understanding, right, of, you know, this is what I believe is the benefits of learning Python or what I could do with it or what Python could bring to the to the team, as an example. Uh, yeah. And then that that's essentially a cycle at that point. I like that, it, it, that it's a cycle. It's an iterative loop of, you know, kind of take a shot in the dark, see what happens, see where it lands. Um, but also kind of what you're saying is, is an, an experimental mindset or divergent thinking or blue sky thinking, all of these are um, have elements of chaos. Um, and darkness, um, where, where, you know, ignorance is good, like recognizing ignorance rather than pathologizing it or, or fearing it. Um, but also it requires a, a level of fearlessness to say, okay, like, let's go, let's go into uncharted territories. Um, and, and part, this is, this is where too much order can be bad conforming to the establishment or conforming to institutional norms. By definition, if you stick to what, you know, you won't discover anything new. Um, and so yeah, once it's, it's ignorance yeah, as a ahead. tool, right? Oh, I think you froze. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, ignorance as a tool. Right. Yes. Ign- ignorance is a tool and, and recognize it. I also say that cognitive dissonance is a tool. Um, if, if you, if you, cognitive dissonance is not a bad thing, it is a superpower. It is the ability to recognize when two things in your head are irreconcilable. And that is an avenue to explore. Um, but I also, one, one thing that I kind of want to add is is I kind of have this mentality of aiming for failure, um, like find the edges and boundaries of what you can and can't do and wh- or what you do and don't know. And so like I just recently got back into rock climbing. And so <laughs> if you climb the same route over and over again, yeah, you can get a little bit stronger. But like I climb routes that I know that I can't do because um, that's the that's the best way to improve. And so I'm improving rapidly kind of trying to reclaim a lot of, you know, lost skill because it's been 10 years since I did climbing regularly, but I aim for failure. I aim for, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, that's, again, ignorance is a tool recognizing that I don't know how to do something and doing it anyways. Um, so I like, I like that. And it, it, it is very courageous. Uh, some of my, one of my peers in, in the YouTube AI creator space, um, I told him some experiments that I wanted to do. He's like, you're very fearless. And I'm like, I don't have time for fear. Now, that's not to say that like fear is bad and you have know, toxic stoicism, um, but but recognizing recognizing that fear can also be too constrictive if you give into it too much. I think is is a key lesson there. Anyways, that's my ramble <laughs> in response to in in response to what you're talking about with um, divergent thinking. No, I, I would agree. I think another to use another analogy. Are you familiar with the um, the trading card game Magic: The Gathering? Oh yeah, played some played some FNM with some friends. Yeah, so I, I used to play back in the day as well too. And the the analogy that I that I've kind of like layered over that that cycle is I, I called it knowledge the gathering, because <laughs> all right, the way, 
like, well, because essentially it's at least to me, it resonates with how I would construct a magic deck back in the day where I come up with an idea that I don't even know whether or not it's physically possible, but it's based on something that inspired me and the little bit of knowledge that I know about it. Right. So like, let's say, you know, in the context of this, you know, this is a card game where you, you play cards and you battle against another opponent. And when you play a card that's called entering the battlefield. And sometimes cards have effects that when that happens, something else happens. Right. So it could be, let's say, an inspiration of like when a card comes in the, into the battlefield, I have found a way to to loop that and gain infinite life, let's say. Right. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a hack, so to speak, but it's legal within the context of the game. So it's like, OK, that's a very exciting idea. Now, how can I do that? And the the breadth and the expansion phase there at the very beginning is looking through literally your entire collection of cards and seeing like, all right, what could possibly be useful to this to achieve this or might be, you know, uh, something that could help make this a reality. And then once you've assembled, you know, your stack of, I don't know, hundreds of cards at that point, that could be a deck. Uh, and for, for reference, the deck limit is typically 60 cards. So you've got a bit of work to do. Uh, so the next step there is the the engagement with the cards, right? So actually looking at the value of each card of what it could provide to the deck is this, you know, which cards are better than others, which cards are uh, duplicative of each other and, and maybe aren't necessary for the sake of efficiency. Uh, third part would then be the um, the engagement with it, right? So actually starting to, or I think I skipped a step there, but so grab all the cards, look at the cards and game with the merit of them. Okay. Yeah. And then engage, engage more in depth. So actually it's like start, start to string together. Like what is the win condition for this deck or how do I get this infinite combo? What does it look like in a, in a mental flow chart of, I have to play this card and then this card happens and this happens in order to achieve this and what must be true as well of the opponent in order to not mess that up. Right. Uh, and then lastly, the, the assembly stage or the, the, the bringing it all together to a common understanding would be the building the deck. Right. So now how do I take this, this strategy and this idea that I've now assembled how to do it and boil it down to 60 cards that will work in the set in the context of a, an actual live game with another another player right and then right. you learn you learn more from that <laughs> as it happens as you play and then you go back to the beginning and to to try to adapt it so that was kind of my my personal analogy with how i resonated with the find more info consolidate it learn it and apply it and then go back to the beginning it, it's it's normally it's based around the, the catalyst is ideas or or inspiration right. that that causes that um that excitement I like that. Uh, well, one, that's a, that's a perfect metaphor because brewing a deck. So for, for any watchers, any, any anyone in the audience, so Magic the Gathering, you get a bunch of cards. There's all kinds of characteristics. Um, you get like creatures, you get events, you get magic. There's all kinds of stuff. It's like Pokemon, but way more complex. Um, and there's tens of thousands of cards out there and they're always releasing new cards. So it's a collectible card game. And so the the, the behavior that we're talking about is what's called brewing a deck. And the idea is that it's like magic itself. It's like brewing a potion there. You put all kinds of ingredients in and you can just pick 60 cards at total random. Um, that is an option. You can say, I'm just going to pick a deck full of green monsters or druids or whatever. Um, there's often themes. And so then you play test it. You, you, you go out into, you know, Friday night magic, you know, play against some friends, play against yourself or whatever. And you see what happens. You see what tricks or combos mechanisms or, or other, or whatever, you know, things pop up and you see how it plays against other decks and that sort of thing. And so magic, the gathering is like the quintessential emergent gameplay structure. But I also like just copy pasting that like with the synecdics and just say, what if you treat leadership like that, where you're looking at you're brewing, like what are all the options that you have in terms of buttons you can push and levers and skills you can acquire information that you've gathered and consolidated and when you put all that together, what new capabilities does that allow you to reach for? Or what new options does that present to you out in the landscape of business or management or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve? I love that. Yeah. And that sense. also, yeah, that, that kind of harkens too to the, um, a little bit back to the, my, my first comment about uh, transferable skills, right? So if you put yourself in the, in the position of, let's say a, um, a party commander, in like an adventuring party for a tabletop role-playing game, right? You're trying to build a team and depending on how you diversify that team, what skills they have, where they, they need opportunities for improvement and how you can give them that in the, in the, in the course of your adventures towards your ultimate goal to vanquish the ultimate evil or, you know, whatever the end objective is there, you know, how can you grow them in a way so that it enables 
what you're trying to achieve in the first place, which may even just be the end objective of, I need to get this, this party functioning well enough to be able to take out the, the evil guy at the end of the story. Right. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, uh, it's, you know, literal team building to figure out what skills would benefit my team and help them achieve, achieve the, the, the mission or the vision that I've set forth. Um, yep. and how could I provide them at least opportunities to be able to gain those, those skills, whether or not it's actually, uh, like mandated training, so to speak, but give, give them scenarios and opportunities in which to, to experience those things firsthand and formulate their own opinions and be able to solidify that in their own minds and also make the, you know, as we were say, saying before there, make their own assumptions as to what skills that they're seeing would be useful, you know, because, you know, the, no, nobody has all the answers, right? And that's, that's the other part is being open to, to feedback both, both ways. Like, well, while visions and strategy are important, uh, the, the agile aspect of it is something that I think is also very important because as they say, you know, the best laid plans, mice and men, <laughs> off go ugly. Right. Or as, uh, what was it? Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, something like right. that. Right, or, or reality, or yeah, any any of that, all of the above. Oh, and, and so some of these principles that are emerging are how do you how do you navigate the chaos? How do you manage the uncertainty and the risk? And, and how do you, you know, because again, going back to game theory, we all have incomplete, imperfect information. Um, that is just a fact of life. You're never going to know everything. And so uh, same thing when you're brewing a magic deck, you, you do the best that you can to have the right defenses, the right offenses, the right victory conditions or, or end game strategy, but you don't know what you're going to confront. So I like that in terms of looking at that as a, as a transferable skill set and just saying, okay, well, uh, you have, what, what tricks do you have up your sleeve as contingency plans? Or, uh, if you know that you're going to go up against a certain kind of, adversary you know you've got a you've got a, a few strategies that you can pick from but it's very fuzzy it's not like in some cases there, there's very direct affordances like if this happens this is always the best response but in many cases especially when there's that many options um in terms of the strategies that you can adopt strategies that your opponents can adopt um but then as you're saying um integrating that feedback right learning from it as fast as you can um, and paying attention and, and being open to that. Cause in a game, it's very obvious who wins or loses. Um, but you know, in, in, in life and leadership or management or business, it's not always as cut and dry. Yep. A hundred percent. The, the other part of that too, is not in, in addition to just even the, the feedback loops, it's also, um, being able to, to learn, to learn more about the, the system itself and, what information like low, so lowering the, the the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns right so even even like through boiling it down to like some heuristics right like in the context of the magic game um you know what decks are very popular right now that i'm likely to face if i go play out in public right or by knowing my deck's own weaknesses i can determine okay what are the the top five things that are most likely to cause me to lose the game right and be able to build contingencies and at least for those things and see where there might be room for them to also apply to other scenarios so that if they're multifaceted in that in, in that um respect but by by seeking further information and looking to to analyze what you know and what you don't know will will kind of point you in the right direction for where where you could spend your time effectively to try to mitigate against the highest likelihood of risk yep yeah no and 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 risk management is a huge thing that comes up again and again in system thinking um conversations so absolutely um so yeah uh, as we're kind of winding down i want to just ask you if there's anything any topics that we didn't get to that you want to cover or or uh anything that you want want people out there to know what would what what's what's a message or a lesson that you want you want to get out there well i suppose i uh i should probably talk about localization at some point, considering it's my <laughs> profession for the past, the past 10 years. But I'd like to, if, if I could take it in the, in the context of an article that you had written recently as well about uh, AI as a translator, could you, could you summarize that? Yeah. So the, 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 it was a video article, um, but basically that the, the structural affordance that generative AI gives us is basically a universal translator. And so when you have a universal translator, you suddenly have, uh, the the co the economic cost of having everything available in your native language basically drops to zero or near zero, 
And this is going to drastically increase the epistemic boundaries for all communicators. So that means if you're a communicator from Africa or China or Russia or South America or North America or England or France or wherever, suddenly language barriers go away. That's the, the TLDR is if language barriers go away, that structurally systematically changes the information flow across the world, which I think will have profound impacts um, in the long run. And I, I would uh, tend to agree with that too, that, that uh, language, uh, removing language as a barrier will, will trend towards, towards peace and success in the long term. The, the one piece though, that I think is, is interesting to consider is that language itself, you know, we've, we've had, um, we've had technology similar to AI for oh, just about a decade now. So that is one, one of the interesting things about the localization industry is that we were, we were using AI before it was cool kind of thing <laughs> through, uh, through neural, neural machine translation is the example. And, you know, since, since that came out around when Google put it out around like 2016 or so there, um, the, the language as a barrier part, I think, is is still tempered with the 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 cultural aspect aspect of it. So more more around the shared narratives of the the people themselves. Where if you think of language as another analogy here, if if language is a is a barrier like a mountain range is as far as how epistemic train uh, tribes form. Um, if you remove that mountain range, the people who were clustered together there are still you know bonded by a number of other shared th things as well. It's just now that they can walk freely to another another place, right? But if they had conflicts before with people on the other side of the mountain range, they'll probably still exist, you know, after the mountain range is removed, they can just see it, see them clear now. Right. And, right. and, and hear them from across the mountain range. So with that, I think the, the, the focus is on um, more about building a shared understanding around uh, cultures and beliefs and being able to adapt to, to build up knowledge around those things in order to communicate from a place of, of, of empathy and a place of understanding of what, you know, what, what context do they live in, right? What analogies are relevant to them? So like half the stuff that we've talked about may not be relevant to somebody in any, you know, any number of countries across the world here, maybe the, you know, the global South, maybe that's not even you know popular right now. Uh, maybe there's a stigma against it for one reason or another. So like being able to, to sheet, to speak in that shared narrative and to leverage analogies that are effective, you know, that, that all comes from an understanding of the culture itself, not just the language. Right. Right. So I, I just thought that was an, an, an is an interesting point. No, absolutely, and and that's a, that's a great place to wrap up. Where you know building shared narratives, either either finding them, constructing them, um, but but then but then also to your point, contextualizing them. Cultural context is the predicate of building shared narratives because you can't just gloss over everything with shared narratives. It has to start from that that localization, that contextual context, that that cultural context. So. Thank you uh, for jumping in, Carter. It's been a real, uh, very um, intense and um, enjoyable conversation. And so just, again, thanks so much for jumping in and reaching out and volunteering. Um, yeah, thanks. That's, that's pretty much all I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Appreciate being here. Excellent. You're welcome.